I'm talking about the death of dreams, son. About losing the big, wild, make-believes that keep you going. The impossible dreams. That kind of jolly pretend is dead, for me. All I can see is rotten teeth in a killer smile. I guess each of us, at some time, finds one person with whom we are compelled towards absolute honesty. One person whose good opinion of us becomes a substitute for the broader opinion of the world. And that opinion becomes more important than all our sneaky, sleazy schemes of greed, lust, self-aggrandizement, whatever we are up to while lying the world into believing we are just plain nice folks. I was her truth object, and she was mine. The analyst who recorded the epic struggle that took place while the company was in service to the pain god had written a lot of words, sometimes going into great detail about daily minutia, but he had had very little to say about the men with whom he had served. Most had left their mark only when he recorded their passing. I have been accused of the same. It has been said that too often, when I bother to mention someone in particular, it is only as a name of the slain, and maybe there's truth in that, or maybe that's getting it backwards. There is always pain in writing about those who have perished before me, even when I mention them only in passing. These are my brethren, my family, now almost my children. These annals are their memorial, and my catharsis. But even as a child, I was a master at damping and concealing my emotions. Apparently none of us really remember anything exactly the way it happened, and often the divergence is proportional to the amount of ego and wishful thinking we have invested. Water sleeps, but the enemy never rests. For now I just rest and indulge myself in writing, in remembering the fall, in considering the strange twists life takes, in considering what plan God must have. If the good are condemned to die young, while the wicked prosper. If righteous man can commit to the evil, while bad men demonstrate unexpected strengths of humanity. Soldiers live and wonder why. There were dreams. I remembered everyone who had gone before me. I remembered the places and times. Cold places, hot places, weird places. Always stressful times. Swollen with unhappiness, pain, and fear. Some died, some did not. It makes no sense when you try to figure it out. Soldiers live and wonder why. Hello everyone. Today it is time, finally, I have been for almost a year now, in the background with all these reviews, been going through The Black Company, which is officially a 9-book series, but I'm going to refer to it as a 10-book series, uh, following, well a military group called the Black Company. And this is going to be, let's say, review, because I, I think I really love this series. Um, if, if I did a, a another version of my top series right now, this would sneak into the top 10. It wouldn't be in the top half, but it would make the top 10. And it makes it there because my floor of enjoyment for this series is extremely high. I at least really like all the books. There's not a single one I'm even like lukewarm on but i would only say i like there wasn't a lot of books that i loved like it didn't have the highest highs that is until the final two books both of which were my favorite two in the series so that elevated it but i can recognize that this series despite the fact that i love it has less mass appeal than a lot of the other series i love so in good conscience, I could not just make a review where I pitch it as amazing and that all of you should read it, because I think a lot of you probably won't like it that much. But a lot of you also will love it, and that might be more than the amount that you think. And I do want to say, for how much time to give the series, because this can vary through series to series, and I think you should give it more than one book. The books are very short. This is like 600 pages. This is the first three books. Um, so the first book, three books are all very short. All three combined are like 700 pages. And the black, the first book, The Chronicles of the Black Company, is the most unlike the other book in that it's almost a short story collection, 
Um, it's a bunch of kind of connected short stories, each one following like a different military related event. And it's, it's Croker, who's the, the analyst, meaning like the company historian's account of those events. Uh, every other book after this is not that. They're all a much more connected narrative, and he actually goes from both extremes. He goes from the first book is six chapters, the next book is equally long, and it's like 50. Um, the first book, like, I was 40 pages into the book, and I was like, wait, does Glenn Cook just not do chapters? Is he another Terry Pratchett? And then book two, chapter one ends on page two, and then chapter two ends on page three. Um, so I think you should give it two books unless you, like, hated The Black Company. Um, but, uh, so, I, yeah, and then I think, um, you shouldn't give it more than three. If you're unsure after three books, like, if you don't like it after three books, if you're not sold, then your mind is not going to be changed by, by the next seven, in all likelihood, especially because I think book two is still one of my favorites of the series. Um, so for those of you who don't know, The Black Company, for what it's about, it's, 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 uh, it's one of the main inspirations for Malaz and Book of the Fallen, and if you've read Malaz and Book of the Fallen, you know you follow a lot of soldiers. This is just, like, only that part. So you follow The Black Company, which is a mercenary group that, uh, as, is, is, uh, you know, mercenaries, and they are considered some of, like, the most dangerous, uh, crafty, tricky, enduring mercenary groups on the entire planet, and we start off, this is a first-person retrospective narrative uh, from Croker, but who the analyst is and even how some of the same analysts choose to tell the story changes throughout the series. So book one is like all first-person retrospective Croker, um, but like sometimes, for example, in some of them from various analysts, there might be like later they accounted someone else's like telling of events, which they then like canonized and also wrote down to include in the end. So even though it's from like, something might be from Croker's point of view, there can also be third-person chapters from other point of views. For example, book two has uh, another point of view who's mir whose name is Shed, who I think is actually, like, a brilliant character. If you've read Joe Abercrombie, he kind of reminds me of, you know, the little people chapters? If you took one of those characters and just, like, had an entire book about them and then that person's story interacted with a group of amoral mercenary Malazan Marines, I love Shadows Linger. Shadows Linger is amazing. Um... And the other thing is, this is considered one of the precursor grimdark novels. It's, um, as grimdark novels go, it's not, like, the most grimdark. I think, um, like, I think it's a lot more, like, A Song of Ice and Fire in how dark it is than it is in, like, Joe Abercrombie, where Joe Abercrombie, despite the fact that, like, it doesn't have the highest body count, and sometimes people read it and it's like, ah, oh, that wasn't that dark, um, is very, very pessimistic about human nature. Um, and how, like, the practice of trying to be good is, like, self-defeating. Um, in The Black Company, it might be hard, but I don't think it, um, is quite as pessimistic about human nature. And there is often, you know, there are good people who act in somewhat noble fashion. It's just, you know, not rare. And it is still, like, pretty dark, and there's not exactly very many moral bastions here. Um, like, no one is quite like a, a Ned Stark. But, you know... It, it, it is, I would say, like, it technically, I if, I don't think grimdark's that useful of a word because everyone has a different definition of grimdark. Um, it's pretty dark. It's not super ultra-pessimistic about humanity, and the point isn't going to be, like, how pointless things are. That's just not what it's going to be about. Um, and also, one thing worth noting is the company is pretty large, mercenary group. Its numbers vary throughout the series, but probably on average it's about, like, in the low thousands, and you're not going to see names for most of these people. This series does not have a huge cast of characters. It doesn't have a small cast of characters, but most of the company-related stuff are focused more on, like, a few people, and a, some of the, a lot of the people you focused on are the people who, like, kind of have a conscience and are kind of stop the black company from just being, like, a terrorizing group of people that goes around killing people. Um, but there are also absolutely lots of people who just join the company to escape their lives and are v not worried morally about what they do that they want and are just very happy to kill but whoever they're told to kill and will do, you know, all the horrible things you would associate with soldiers in a war, like, you know, when they take a city and pillaging and rape and all of that. 
Um, and also, the, all the narrators are unreliable to a various degree and in different ways. None of them are like completely reliable because they're all they're all people and they're all characters. Um, but for example, like one way that Croker is unreliable, and Croker's upfront about this. Croker just says like one of the first like things I was taught is that like you don't say bad things about family. And the black company, he sees the black company as his family. So he will at times acknowledge the horrible things the black company does, but you can you can really tell he's deliberately not focusing on it. And um, like if a bystander who wasn't invested in the black company like as a social group was writing the story, they would probably be much more negative about the black company. Um and, like, for an example, uh, I think Glenn Cook plays with, like, the unreliability. Sometimes he's funny about it. Like, um, one analyst will literally says, like, at this point, these two past analysts, like, directly contradicted each other. And, like, they both insisted that they were right. And so, like, one of them has to be wrong because, like, th they're talking about the same thing. And one person says it was, like, four days. And one person says it was 12. Like, those can't both be true. Um... So if you if you know if you like an unreliable narrator that might be fun and it's one that's like upfront about how where it's unreliable um, and like there's another quote that was in the reading about how like people don't actually remember things correctly so uh, you know you you have to sometimes scrutinize some of the dialogue um, and there are a few things in this that I think are like there's a lot of aspects of this series are things that I think are just uncontroversially awesome. And then there's some things where I could see people really liking Glenn Cook's approach, like I do, or really disliking it. And then there's some things that annoyed me that could annoy you and could not annoy you. So first I'm going to talk about the main thing that I think is just uncontroversially incredible. And that is the group dynamic is uh, the black company has has its own, like, culture. Um, and because the people in the black company, like, they don't talk a lot about their past because generally people join the black company to escape their past life. And one thing that's consistently done by the people at the top of the black company, like it's a part of what makes them the black company, is to drive home the importance that the company is a brotherhood. So that like, you know, well, it's fine. Like, yeah, where you kill people for money and you're, it's fine if you murder people. There are a few things that are driven into people as soon as they join. Like when they're training people who join the company, it's not just like, this is how you use a sword. You will, they also train like these people are your brothers. No man is left behind. If someone the company does not break its contract, and if the people who hold the contract betray us, that does not go unanswered, ever. Uh, and also, there are sometimes like important people in the company will instill new, new virtues. So Croker, who's the protagonist to start, is also the company physician. And throughout the series, is it is noted that the company is much more careful about, like, cleanliness and avoiding disease than almost every other military group. There's, like, a line here that's, like, in, for most wars, more soldiers are lost to dysentery than combat, but that has never been true of, like, the company while I'm a part of it. Um, and this is, like, it's done so well that... Sometimes some of these things, like, I'll be reading it, and I'm, like, really worried that aspects of the company's, like, social framework and culture will degrade, which I don't know why I should care about that, but I do. Um, they also, the people in the company tend to be very informal with each other, while at the same time generally being, like, extremely dangerous and very competent and, like, when they need to be very focused. Uh, if you've read Malaz and Book of the Fallen, this will sound very familiar to you because it's exactly the dynamic of Malaz and Marines, who are some of the most dangerous soldiers on the planet, but also, like, are constantly bantering with each other. Um, like, if you've read Malaz and Book of the Fallen, a lot about the Black Company is going to be familiar because Erickson basically was just like, oh, the Black Company's culture is really cool. I'm just going to, like, put that in Malaz and Marines. The other is, like, the Black Company, their names, they're not actually names, and as it is in Malaz and Book of the Fallen, like, all the names are either just, like, descriptors of people or ironic descriptors of people. Um, so, like, there's a character named Silent because he never talks. And this this is, you know, th this is also the case with, with you know, Malazan. Um And, like, one thing that I find really interesting about the company is... 
a lot of their they are a lot of them very dedicated to what they see as their norms and laws but i think if you were just like a bystander and were like observing the company for a short amount of time it would not appear that that is the case because the things that are their laws or norms are very different than what we would normally consider for example they take pride in like fighting dirty and winning via trickery that's like one of the reasons they've been around for 400 years they don't just do it because it's practical they will win via trickery they'll try and trick people and like win by basically try and cheat because that's like the black company way um they almost always have a captain and an analyst who uh, and a lieutenant who have all read the annals and so they have a record of like past battles and one of the points of the annals is supposed to be to like keep track of the conflicts so that future people can like draw on that information and whether it works which is also one of the reasons why the annals focuses on like different things than would be expected in a conventional narrative because it's supposed to be the annals of the black company not like it's not croker's journal so he's not writing the kind of things that like for other first person retrospectives that fitz or koth or harry dresden would who are recounting the story of their lives because he's t t trying to tell a story about the company through his point of view um and I think the best example of, like, the combination of not taking anything seriously while also being, like, really effective is seen with two of my favorite characters in the series, which is One-Eye and Goblin, who are kind of, like, they're wizards, because this world has wizards, but they're kind of weak wizards, but they're, like, really old. Wizards can live a long time here, and they're visually, like, really old. If you were a really powerful sorcerer and you were, like, 200, like these people are, you'd look like you were 20, but they you know, they look old because they are aging. They're just aging shortly. And a lot of their magic is focused on like trickery and illusions. And they spend most of their time just messing with each other and like trying to just basically troll and I guess prank is the word, but a little bit more serious than that. Um, which by the way, I find incredibly entertaining, but also like they're kind of the backbone of the company. Like a lot of the company's success is rooted in using these kind of low level sorcerers that most armies would just dismiss um, ext in extremely clever fashions. And they're such a great example of like the type of like friends who they're not the friends. It's like, you know, they'll help you up when you're down. They're the friend who, you know, if they watch the other fall in the mud, they'll laugh at the person as they try and get up and slip and then push them when they fall back over. But also you still can tell like they are best friends and they're actually, they're one of my favorite duos in the genre if i ever made a top 10 duo list they would make it for sure i they're also two of my favorite characters in this series and i think they're a great illustration of like of the type of culture the black company has despite the fact that they're constantly messing around and are like old and cranky and you know anytime they're stuck in a place for a long time one of their first priorities is like finding a way to create alcoholic drinks and they gamble and they cheat when they're gambling and everyone knows when they cheat the gambling despite all that like you do not want to be on the other side of a battle with them because of how cleverly they're used and how entrenched in black company culture they are um and another interesting aspect of the company as a culture is when you think mercenary you think of people who are like extremely motivated by money but the black company, like, it's mostly people went to escape their lives. So they're not actually, like, they don't seem to be super motivated by payment. Like, they're not trying to get rich and retire. This almost is, like, what they're retiring to, to try and escape things from their past life. Um, and I think that also could be, like, one reason that I'm going to talk about later is you don't really get backstories of characters. And this is one of the reasons why, because the backstories aren't a part of who they are for the company. Um, so that's the main thing that I think is like uncontroversially incredible about the black company. Like I think if you're for if you're someone who like never DNF'd and you read the series and didn't like it, you would still be hard pressed to make a not dumb, a not stupid case for like, if you were trying to say like, no, it's not like a good writing of this group dynamic. Um, a couple other things that I think are kind of uncontroversially awesome is the interaction with like really powerful long-lived sorcerers. 
Uh, this is something I'm slightly picky about, which is, like, the multi-century old characters in fantasy novels. I just think most authors are not able to write people who come across as 300. Um, not saying I could do better, it's probably really, really hard. Uh, but I think Cook pulls it off, and I think he has century-old characters that feel like they're century-old, and I really, really enjoy the interactions. Uh, this is actually one of my favorite parts about, like, the first book about the Black Company. It's got, like, um, the lady who's who's on the cover is kind of, like, almost the Dark Lord, and, and she has these ten really powerful sorcerers who are kind of, like, bound to her will called the Ten Who Were Taken, and I love the interactions with these sor sorcerers. And also the world just has some really cool stuff. Um, I am going to talk about, like, now we're going to move on to aspects you could love or hate, and I'm going to move off world because I think the way the world building is communicated could be something you really enjoy or it couldn't. And this is, again, come from, this is supposed to, this is written as if it is the annals of the Black Company for future members of the Black Company to read. And as a that it doesn't really like directly say things about world building very much you kind of just have to like figure it out there's also like there's no map and things will just be referred to that the people for the later black company theoretically would know although then this actually ends up becoming a problem because like really old versions of the black company annals will do the same thing and the people from then like the, our current characters will be like i don't know what the hell this is so they're having the same problem we have um, that being said, I just think it has some really cool stuff, and this aspect of it is done really well. Unfortunately, it doesn't have an insane amount of names, so I didn't ever find it, like, super hard to keep track of, but a lot of the time, like, you just have to roll with it, like, Croker's gonna mention Katavar, and you're just gonna be like, I don't know what Katavar is, Croker, I haven't read all of these, I don't know the origin of the Black Company. Um, and the next thing, and I think this is actually probably the m largest aspect that could be love or hate it, and it is the writing style. Um, I love the writing style, but I could totally see why someone would bounce off of it. Glenn Cook is very terse. You may have heard me say this before, but he is very short, to-the-point sentences. Like, the man gets charged for every comma he includes. Um, so the average sentence length for some of these books is probably, like, four words. Um, and this may give the impression that it's very, like, transparent see-through prose, that its goal is to just be, like, a background detail and just to serve its purpose, but it actually isn't, and, like, despite being short sentences, I often, like, found myself admiring, like, the construction of the words and the way he's using the sentences and think it actually, like, if it is a writing style that you mesh with adds to the enjoyment of the series, um... I, I think it has a really nice rhythm to it. I remember early on in book one, I noticed a lot of paragraphs, like if a paragraph would be like 10 sentences, it'd have like nine really short sentences. It'd have like four short sentences and then one like normal length sentence, maybe even with a comma or two, and then a bunch of short sentences. And for whatever reason, like it just had a very nice rhythm and was natural and immersive for me to read. But I also think some people just read it and it's just like all sentences and it's just unnatural. I think what it managed to do is a lot of the time it makes, like, the unit that I'm reading sentences instead of words. The same way that, like, you know, as you learn to read, you go from, you don't, you, we don't read individual letters, we read words. Like, if I see the word conveys that I'm looking at on my screen, I don't have to go, like, okay, C-O-N-V-E-Y-S, okay, that means conveys. I just look at it and know it's conveys. It conveys the word conveys. And Glenn Cook, I think, sometimes does the same thing at sentences, where I'll just look at a sentence and the meaning comes in as a sentence. Um, which, I don't know, anyway, it works, but if it's not for you, that's fine, um, and I also think, like, just from a craft perspective, it conveys a lot of information. I noticed while I was going back and reading through, trying to find, like, quotes for the intro, I, I, a lot of the stuff I saw, I think had a lot of meaning that I'd missed on the first time, um, in hindsight, and I think it's going to be very rereadable, and, um, is, like, extremely information dense. Uh, so... Basically, like, I could get, if you don't mesh with it, this is, um, this is something that, like, if you, you know, if you bounce off the writing style, you bounce off the writing style, there's probably not going to be that much can change. The writing style is going to change throughout. Like, that is one thing Glenn Cook is also very, very good at, is the actual analysts will write differently based on you go. So, for one of the books, like, after the first paragraph, I was able to tell who the analyst was just based on sentence structure. So when you have the different like writers, the different analysts for the Black Company, they don't just see the world differently. They have a different writing style, and it's reflected in their writing style. And like he's really good at that. 
he still uh generally i forget the words for this but like there's the two types of ways of like writing things one is like you have a sentence and you put a bunch of information to make the sentence longer and the other is just like a number of sentences um rockio talked about this because dune and uh sun eater are the opposite so it's like guy gabriel okay a lot of writers where he'll just make that two sentences and this is still going to be the case for all the writers for all the analysts for the black company so you're not going to see an m dash in this entire series um but uh yeah i'd say just give it a try if you don't like it that's fine uh another thing that i that I really love, but I could see bouncing off people is way the way Glenn Cook writes characters. And I think there's one thing, like I think he does every he's a really good character writer, but there's a difference to how he writes characters to most other people. Um, and that is if you think of like the first thing you would do when you're trying to describe a character. Like think of a character you would like and how you would like describe the character to start. You're gonna start with their backstory. You're gonna be like, you know, okay, so Harry Dresden is like a wizard detective who lives in Chicago, blah, 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 blah. Glenn Cook just doesn't give you backstories for people. Um, there are, you know, I, I've, I've read a lot about One Eye. I have no idea what One Eye's life was like before book one. I know a bunch of stuff One Eye did during the series, and this is true for a lot of people. You do learn some backstory stuff for some of the analysts for The Black Company, but even still, like, the things I know about Croker from below book, before book one are, like, minimal. I mean, I know he had a mother who conveyed that he shouldn't say bad things about family. That's like almost it. And so I think it maybe makes them slightly harder to latch onto. Um, but I don't know, it just didn't bother me. And I, I just think he's very good at the other aspects of characterization. Like they have personality and I think he's very efficient with his characterization. Um, and also that there are characters that uh, do like are complicated and multifaceted and you get to see that more and more as you go throughout the series. Um, and I think in a great example of how efficient he is with characterization is, I mean, there's a character named silent who doesn't talk. And I, I, I'm like, I really like the character silent and he, he hasn't zero lines of dialogue. Like he doesn't say anything. Um, but you know, again, this is something you can try. It might not be for you. You might know it annoys you. You might hear that and be like, no, I don't need to know the backstory. I just want to know like what they do from now on and see who they are as a person, which does one thing that is nice is it kind of gives you, makes you less bias for the characters as you start because you're not starting with their role or like what their backstory is. You're just seeing who more who they are. Um, and one other thing is, and this isn't true for every narrator, but is especially true in the first book, then he loosens up a little bit, but um, Croker, as the analyst, a lot of the time does not recount what his thoughts are on things. I think he just probably wouldn't see how it's relevant. He's like, he's writing about the company, like, why should people in a century care that Croker thought this was, like, morally problematic? Um, and I will say, like, the stuff we get when Croker does say his thoughts... I think are really good, but it's something that I could see leading to him being slightly separated from the reader. And one, one last thing I want to mention that I think is, is really done well later. Something that improves throughout the series is as you might expect from a book series written in the eighties about a military group, uh, it started off, it's a bit of a sausage fest. There's not a lot of, like, there's a lot more male characters than female characters. And I do want to say, as the series goes through, like, series has some really good female characters and is, I think, a lot more balanced on that front than you would expect it to be. And I just want to mention that this improves a lot throughout the series. I don't think, like, the female characters to start are, like, bad. I just think there aren't that many because, like, the military group is almost all guys and it's the story of that, but, um, that does, that, that's just something that I want to mention in Proust of the series. Um, and the last of which, and this is something that I know most people who watch this aren't going to care about this, but I know it's not none, and that's just, I mean, it's pretty obvious, but I'm just going to say, like, the main characters are not heroic, like, they're morally questionable, sometimes they're straight up, like, bad, um, you probably were able to figure that out based on, like, knowing anything about the black company but i thought it i would mention it okay and the last section is things that actually like annoyed me a little bit which this is going to be a very short sent uh, section because every author has their quirks and generally like 
Glenn Cooks didn't annoy me that much. But one that did annoy me is the the death fake outs. Um, there are lots of real like character deaths, but a lot of those powerful sorcerers I mentioned, they are really hard to kill, and some of them die mul have multiple deaths. One especially, it was almost to the point of silliness, but. This kind of annoyed me. It was with the one. There was one that got silly. Like, whatever. I'm not going to say more for spoiler reasons, but this is something that's going to be in this series. There will also be very real character deaths, but a lot of the time, like, you know, you'll be like, they'll be like, this person's dead, and then the next, it'll be like, never mind, he's not dead. Cool. Um, and also, later on, this is kind of a similar thing where it's like, uh, antagonists get defeated, but then, like, they're going to come back later. Um, they stop having as many death fake outs and instead it switches to like, they just get captured and then they're held and then they escape and then they're an antagonist again. This, this also happens a few times. Now, usually they have a reason to hold these people captive. So, so it's not dumb, but I, at times was just like, just kill them. Like they're going to be the antagonist again. What are you doing? Have you not learned your lesson? Um, which granted one of the analysts says, cause one of the analysts isn't in charge and he's like, we should just kill them. Then they escape. And he's like, see, we should have just killed them. And everyone's like, okay, you have a point. Um, and that's honestly one of my only ones. I guess there's one of the analysts is more focused on himself, which ironically makes it more like a traditional narrative. But there's there's one method of like how the story is conveyed through some of those that I found slightly less engaging. But that's like only a minor nitpick for like two bucks. So who cares? And Overall, I think this series is really worth a try. It's funny because I went in expecting not to like it. I kind of had this on my TBR and I was I was like, I wanted to give it a try. And then I, I, I actually was expecting to not like it. And then I would just start something else. But then my plans were defeated by the fact that it kept being really good. Anyway, um, let me know if you enjoyed the review. Have you read The Black Company? Will you give it a try? Have you, Did you read only book one? And will you consider reading book two? I think you might like it. Um, hi, Scott. <laughs> um... Although the thing is, so hi Scott specifically, I think Scott, like, what could end up happening, like, in reverse, because I think book two could be, like, a lot of people's favorite Black Company book. So I think, um, if you don't like book one, like book two, then that, I mean, if you like book two, you'll probably read book three. Um, and if you read book three and don't like that again, then just bail, even if you like book two. But if you like, if you like two out of three of the first three, um... I think it's worth reading, and that should mean, like, if you dislike both of the first two, don't bother reading book three, because you can't like two out of three, and I think that would be a fair chance to give it, but also, you know, I know everyone, some people are not going to do that, and that is obviously totally fine, uh, if, you know, if you're not going to read, don't want to read 300 pages of a book you might dislike, I can't blame you for that at all, um, I hope everyone enjoyed the review, uh, this was one of the more difficult series to review, just because I think of I think it's really good, and I think it's greater than the sum of its parts. Like, I think if I listed out things like characters, plot, prose, theme, world, and I gave each of them a score out of 10, and that's how I did reviews, the total score would not reflect how much I like this series. Like, I have those versus videos that, like, they're with no little to no literary merit, and I think this series would probably lose to many series that I like less than it. Anyway, I hope you enjoyed the review. Let me know what you think about The Black Company and whether you're going to give it a try. Or, hell, let me know if this review made you realize, hey, this isn't for you, because that is fine as well. No one has time to read everything. Have a nice day, everyone.